criminal justice reform is something that we've been working on for a long time, so it really isn't the first step. It's uh, a middle step in an ongoing process of continuous improvement. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists. I think they were incredible. I want to really, in particular, thank the Quattron Center's uh, team, uh, both the amazing fellows and their panels, my colleague Paul and Ross, uh, but Anna Gavin and her event management team, the folks who run the video booth, Matt and Samir, uh, who were doing video and photography. It always takes us upwards of 30 to 35 people, uh, facilities and others to put on an event like this. Um, and if I could just take a couple minutes, I'd like to try and sort of synthesize some of the things that, uh, that we covered uh, as a way of giving all of us uh, maybe some, uh, some things to do and some things to take responsibility for as we go forward uh, to talk about what's next in criminal justice reform. Um, you know, I think I was very inspired by Mark Holden's comments at the beginning of this, by his awareness that the people, that, that there are people in the criminal justice system, that the people that we are prosecuting uh, are, are human beings, they need to be respected as such, that our system needs that level of humanity for uh, all of the people involved. Um, and I think when we at the Quattron Center talk about a systems approach, part of what we try to do um, is to help each part of the system see each other part of the system for its role uh, rather than and, and separate the, uh, the individuals from the role and understand why people do the things that they do so that we can uh, avoid the dehumanization of the criminal justice system across the board. Uh, and I thought Mark did that in a really compelling way and set a new bar for how we need to think about the corrections role um, and that the First Step Act does that and it suggests that, that that actually can be done and that moral basis for governing can be something that brings people together. And hopefully the fact that we've seen people come together in that realm will help us uh, come together in other realms. I think the other thing that we've, we talked a lot about in various contexts was really, uh, again, you know, the need for data, the need for awareness, and the need for transparency. Um, you know, I don't know how many people know about rapid DNA before we had that terrific panel here. Um, and while I appreciate the Ben Salem Police Department's uh, thought going into its best practices, um, it's also simultaneously, I guess, good and bad to hear somebody say, well, legally, we could deceive you, but but don't worry, we're not doing that in this instance, right? I'm glad they're not doing that in this instance, but it's troubling and accurate to say that they could lie to us about whether your DNA was on a particular report. And it is obviously the case that when somebody comes to you and says, we have your DNA, regardless of its truth, you are gonna be more likely to simply plead guilty. Uh, and I think it will be an ongoing, one of the things that will be a next step issue, I think for us at the center, is this question of how do we make sure that Brady information, that all exculpatory information is known to people uh, at plea bargaining. Um, New York has recently issued new uh, rules for all of their courts to make sure that in felony cases, uh, Brady information is disclosed three days before plea bargaining. While that feels a little bit to me like the sort of thing you sign when you're making disclosures on a house, um, I still think it's a good policy and I think we should continue that um, moving forward. Um, it was great to hear Rachel Barkow and Michelle Phillips talk about how data and administrative structures might be a way to fight the emotions and the knee-jerk reactions that people have to be punitive that have led to mass incarceration. Um, and I think maybe we'll, you know, we're, we're going to continue to gather data to help people get over the knee-jerk reaction that uh, qualified immunity and absolute immunity are necessary for prosecutors uh, and police officers because I think as you heard in this last panel, um, that's really not the case. Um, and I think the suggestion that police misconduct databases, clearly the information has to be carefully gathered and carefully held. It would be hugely ironic uh, if in the instant, if in an effort to uh, avoid wrongful arrests and wrongful convictions, we created uh, wrongful accusations of law enforcement officers. We certainly don't want to ignore the extraordinarily difficult job that the people that, that protect us have. Um, but at the same time, I think people who work for our government do so with an expectation uh, that they are there to serve. Those are service jobs. I think most of our professionals are proud of that. Um, and it's not a coincidence to me that a state like Texas, which has the, one, of the, one, of the most, uh, one of the strongest public records laws, one of the strongest Sunshine Act laws in the country, is also a leader in criminal justice reform. 
Um, and I will say this, just to link this to healthcare, um, what a lot of hospitals have seen when they improve their communications, when they improve their uh, ability to disclose errors, is the first thing that they see is that they see more errors. Now that's not because they're all of a sudden committing more errors. It's because when you really start being open and looking at your procedures, when you, when you uh, acknowledge that the vast majority of errors are not evil but, but good faith errors in complex situations, you discover that there are more errors than you knew about because people are now reporting them. That's a good thing. And we have to be, I think we have to all hold ourselves to a standard where we are not going to be punitive of those errors unless we have absolutely clear evidence of that bad faith. At that point, as you heard Commissioner Ramsey say, that person shouldn't be a cop anymore, that person shouldn't be a prosecutor anymore. Um, but we should be aware of the fact that the first thing we'll see is more errors, and that's progress, because the more errors we know about, the more errors we can improve upon and get rid of going forward. Um, and then uh, the last thing I will say is we had the, that terrific panel on what the citizens of St. Louis were able to do. Um, Bill, I think the work that, that is happening in Philadelphia to take that momentum and turn it to other parts of the system, to the judiciary, and go through that in that next step and next step and next step is great work. It's going to be fascinating to see how that goes. The one thing we didn't talk about in that panel is Given the, the administrative challenges that we have with absolute immunity and the, and the way that it kind of has its tentacles all through the system, I actually think the fastest way to prosecutorial quality will be to have that be something where we're holding our, pro, our, our prosecutors available and making that a metric that people are demanding. We've seen conviction integrity units improve. We've seen uh, people looking at pretrial. We've seen people looking at conviction rates. I think we need to ask, ask prosecutors to be transparent about the allegations of prosecutorial misconduct in their offices and how they react to them. We're asking forensic labs to put all their corrections, uh, corrective actions online. Uh, they are starting to do that. It's part of their accreditation. I think that should be required for prosecutors as well and for police officers as well. There's no reason that information can't be made public uh, and there's no reason that we can't then have conversations about those cases and learn from them. So um, I think the, the overarching themes, which are I think we need to take them on, I think everybody needs to take them on, we need to be humane, we need to be compassionate, we need to be demanding. We need to get the data that we need and we need to deal with it publicly and transparently and then we need to be comfortable with the fact that we're all engaged in a process of continuous improvement and figure out what's next in criminal justice reform. Uh, on behalf of all of my colleagues, I want to thank you guys for being here. We're all going to hang around and be happy to talk more. That's what we do all day. Um, but the secret of a good party is good guests. Uh, and so I really appreciate your being here, sharing your thoughts with us and, uh, and to our panelists for leading all these great conversations. Thanks very much.